Perfect. David, we are so happy to have you here, and that's that's pretty impressive that we got some state-level people here with us as well. I wanted to uh, ask you, you've got that beautiful Barry White voice, as it's been described by many, to uh, project it for the people across the world to be able to hear it. I got a few people saying, I definitely want to hear what David has to say, so uh, we'll just have you uh, speak up a little for us, please. All right, sounds good. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to talk about diversifying lead generation with with Don and David here through the day please feel free please feel free to uh, type in your questions your comments your concerns as we go uh, I'll work them into the conversation we will open the lines for some Q&A at the end if time permits but let's jump right on in one of my questions and it's a saying we've all heard many times is you don't wanna put all your eggs in one basket would you uh, would you agree with that David Oh, absolutely, and I, I believe that was actually, when I came into this business, that was one of the challenges that I had to overcome was the fact that when I came in, there really wasn't anyone telling me what the eggs were, for lack of a better term, and so what ended up happening is, is that I had immediate success in uh, internet lead generation, and so a lot of my focus was internet lead generation in 2004 and 2005. You know, pretty much all you had to do was to stop at a stoplight and the buyer would fall in the car. So I didn't really learn how to diversify my lead generation at that time. And so when we had a little hit in the market here in Columbia, I kind of learned the hard way that there was different methods and different ways that we should be lead generating. So I totally agree with you. me still and let me know if you're I out there you now, all right you hear me David I okay hear I hear Don now too all right so we're back we've got our audio going let's jump right back into where we were Don my question to uh, David and now to you was what's your thoughts on making sure we don't have all our eggs in one basket um, yeah I was listening to what David had to say and, and I would agree um, when I first started um, you know everybody in the world uh, came and presented to me and took me to lunch and talked to me about how I should spend my dollars on um, their print marketing or their um, website or you know what have you and um, it was really a trial and error thing for me especially when the market started to dip a little bit uh, to where to spend my marketing money and, and what was going to be effective and and I probably like other people found out um, kind of just trial and error that internet lead gen tends to be my strongest thing, um, but I certainly still mix the other things in. So yeah, it's a, it's a you know, it's a, it's a formula, I think. Okay, so let's have a look at traditional real estate. We might remember some of these lock boxes. Now some of these old traditional lock boxes are coming back into style with all those REOs out there, for example. But David, talk about traditional real estate marketing without Without getting into all of it yet and the specific types of lead generation, how much of your business do you believe should be traditional lead generation still? I think if you consider traditional lead generation actually meeting with people, networking, writing those personal notes to people that are in your sphere, basically asking everyone in a tactful way if they know someone that's looking to buy or sell. I think that should be probably a good 40 to 60 percent of your business because I think you can be more effective and efficient when you're meeting with real people in real time in real places. And so there's an argument that part of traditional real estate involved newspaper advertising and, and magazines postcards and bellings and things such as that. And I think, in my opinion, personal opinion, that that is becoming more cost 
uh, of a waste of cost in relationship to the return on the investment that you get. Now, I know that Don does a lot of farming, and to me, that is one of the traditional ways as well. But I think in, in, in my market, in my experience, and what my strength is, it's probably between 40 to 60 percent of, of the business I think should be traditional. Okay, so let's flip that over, Don, as David was throwing that to you. What do you think the percentage should be of traditional lead generation? Um, yeah, I'm pretty close with, with what David says. I, I think it's, for me, it's probably a pretty close 50-50, um, so right in line there. And, um, you know, same thing. I, when you think of traditional, you, you do think of postcards and newspapers and things like that. And I, I know myself and my business, I've pulled away from that quite a bit in the last probably two years. Um, but I do farm, uh, which I would consider part of traditional, and, um, but I've adjusted the way I, I work in my farm um, and embraced technology and actual face-to-face -face, um, you know, contact more than I used to. Um, I walk the neighborhood more than I used to, and I get out there and participate in what they're doing. So, um, so yeah, I think it's probably a 50-50 split. Doesn't it get kind of hot out there to be walking the neighborhood? Hey, I'm dedicated. Hey, I'm just checking. I hear from a lot of people that, you know, it gets warm and they don't want to have to do it. I haven't done that in the last two months, but um, but I am going to be, you know, we have a garage sale coming up, so I'll see them in a couple couple weeks. Okay, um, so let's... But, you know, I, I like to get in front of them. Perfect. Well, let's talk about some of that traditional lead generation. Kind of remind some of the people out there of some of the things, you know, Active Rain University, people in the IMSD program, they might be on this call and they might be, yeah, I'm going to Facebook everybody all day long and that's it. Let's talk about some of the traditional lead generation things that are out there. So people might not recognize what this is on their screen. That actually is a telephone. Uh, it has a cord, which means it has to be attached to a wall somewhere and doesn't fit in your pocket, and there's no buttons on it. You didn't have to turn the little thing to make a dial. Uh, Don, you're not old enough to remember a phone that looked like this, but how often are you on the phone? How much time do you put towards calling, and, and who do you call on a regular basis? I, uh, I actually do recognize that phone. Um, I did not myself have one, but my grandma, I think, had one. Um, I spend probably about an hour and a half a day um, I know I'm supposed to sit down and really plug out it for three, but I just don't. I just don't have that in me to do. So I do that an hour and a half. Um, you know, I make the rounds first with anybody that has a birthday or a graduation or an anniversary or anything like that. Um, I make a point to keep on top of those things. Um, and then, you know, I call my my sphere. I pick up the phone if I know that we have an anniversary and when we bought or sold a house, or um, if I know that, you know, they have a life change coming up, those are the ones I usually tackle first because they're the easiest, um, but the ones that I haven't talked to in a while, I make a point to call at least two or three of those every day and, um, you know, just touch base, and, and I don't, I'm not about the hard sell. For me, really, it's about the relationship, so I do that, and then, um, you know, David is going to probably talk more about this because I think it's more of his business, but I, I do make phone calls you know, at least a few times a week to other agents because, you, you know, you got to work those referrals. Okay. Now, so do, you have, doing that too. do you have a specific script you use on those calls to ask for those referrals and not sound pushy? Did I go out again on the uh, audio here? I can hear you. Okay. So do you have a specific script that you that you use to ask for those referrals when you're on the phone, Don? You know, um, I, I do make that, that, that line in there, you know, if, if you have anybody that's looking to, to relocate to or from the Dallas-Fort Worth area, I would love it if you would keep me in mind. Um, but I'm not real pushy about it. Most of the time, the refer, referring agents that I talk to are people that I've met at different events, you know, whether it's our conventions or what have you. And, and so most of the time, it's just a relationship building thing. Hey, how's it going? You know, how's your business? What's going on there? How's your market? That kind of thing. Um, but I would bet you anything, David, that it's got a really tough script. Okay. Now, David, how about you with the phone? Are you, uh, how much time do you put towards calling, and who do you call? Why do you call? When do you call? And what's your script for asking people for referrals when you actually have them on the phone? I would say I'm, I'm probably pretty close to what Don is saying in terms Speak of... Speak up for us a little there, David. Okay, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? I can, as the Verizon commercial Very likes good. to say. Great. Sorry about that. Usually it takes about 60 minutes um, to, to do what I need to do. 
first and foremost, I feel that my sphere of influence and my past clients is my biggest source of referrals. So I try to stay in touch with them as much as I possibly can. And it's interesting because it's not so much that I'm calling them with regards to buying or selling real estate. It's more of what can I do to help you with the day-to-day -day activities that is life. So whether it's do you need lawn care, do you need an attorney, do you need um, someone that can come and fix something. I had a plumbing issue at the house this week, so a uh, plumber. Anything that I can do to stay in flow with them, not so much calling and asking them, who do you know that needs to buy or sell or invest in real estate? Because I want them to like me, know me, and trust me before they even think about sending me a referral. And it makes it much easier for them to send me business because of the fact that I'm in flow with them. So a sphere of influence is very important. I just got off the phone yesterday with two past clients. Uh, one gave me a referral. One is thinking about putting their house on the market. Uh, matter of fact, that particular client chastised me because I didn't stay in touch as much as I should with her. And so I have a sphere of influence, which is really good about challenging me with regards to staying and flow with them. So that is really important to me. Um, the other, the other group of people that I think that we miss at times is the vendors and other individuals that touch real estate transactions that we're a part of. So inspectors, um, attorneys, lenders, on-site builder, building agents, or those that represent builders, all of these individuals come across individuals or their own person that need to buy, sell, or invest. And so definitely do not forget about those particular individuals that you can network with because they get in front of as many people, if not more, than you do, and they have a great baseline for referrals. That's a great point. Thank you for bringing that to everyone's attention, David. You know, lenders do need to buy homes too, so you might as well be their realtor, and they have lots of people that come through. So, how about mail, David? Are you doing any snail mail? Zero. That's that's a Don Rose thing. I, I I've come to find out that for me, what works much better for me is picking up the phone or going and visiting or the electronic way of communication. Okay. So, Dawn, David says that's a you thing. Do you do some snail mail in your business still? I do a little bit of snail mail in my business. Um, the, only, the only group that I, that I mail to on a regular basis is my farm, and that's typically when we have an event coming up. I sponsor a few things there, and, um, you know, from time to time there'll be something going on in the community. That's about it for for the um, print, although I recently um, I recently joined up with Send Out Cards, and so my goal for the next six months is to try to, to really be purposeful about getting cards out in front of people, um, and not just looking for the business, but but honestly, I mean, if, if somebody, um, you know, if you run into somebody at the store that you haven't seen in a couple of months, and it was nice to catch up with them, you know, send them a card to let them know that is is a pretty big deal, um, and so I've, I've recently kind of started to implement that in my business. Okay, so you've started using that, and if people want to know more about that, they can just contact you after to kind of learn about it. I got one sitting here on my desk from a uh, friend, Scott Miller, uh, just showed up in the mail this morning. It's always nice to get a card, isn't it? Yeah, it really is nice to get a card, and Scott Miller actually um, um, got me to send a card to my daughter after her first middle school dance, and she's going to get it this week. So I'm kind of excited to see what her reaction is going to be. Oh, lovely. Perfect. All right. Yes. So they'll contact you after to learn about that. But what about networking groups? I hear it all the time, people doing the networking group. David, are you involved in any networking group, or is your state-level work enough of a network for you? Actually, you can never have a large enough network, so the answer is yes on the state level. Um, that has really helped being a state officer because when people think about real estate in Columbia, I, I like to think that I'm on their short list, so that really has helped. Uh, but I am also in networking groups here uh, that involve people like in the uh, nonprofit organizations here, those are people that are in state government, um, individuals that are in the local municipalities. Uh, individuals that own restaurants. Uh, it's a very diverse group of the network networking group that I'm in. And uh, actually, our networking group has actually created a what's called
called a TED like event. I'm sure people have heard about those little seven or eight minute speeches that individuals give throughout the country in, in a group setting. So we have something that's called uh, Seven Minutes of Success that, that's been created out of this networking group. And so basically, this gives us an opportunity to speak on an array of topics for seven minutes in front of 150, 200 diverse people. So we are all pulling our resources together as a think tank to think of ways to generate leads, not just in real estate, but for each other, because if we're building each other's businesses, then by, by default, they'll help me build my business. Perfect. Okay. So before I ask Don about your networking opportunities, how many of you out there are part of a networking group? Type it into the chat box for me. Let me know. Are you part of the BNI group in your area or another networking group of some specific sort? Obviously, we all want to grow our network, but type it in. Let me know what group you are if you are part of one of the networking groups. And while I'm waiting for your answers to come in, Dawn, are you, are you part of any specific networking groups? I'm not part of any um, networking groups. I, I do network, but it tends to be in um, you know conjunction with running my life. So um, anybody that knows me knows that outside of uh, my working hours, I am probably in a car driving one of my kids to or from a sport um, or to or from a school event. So um, I spend a whole lot of time getting involved in, in those things. I'm heavily involved in the PTA board. Um, I've been a room parent for one of them every year they've been in school. Um, they play hockey and soccer and baseball and taekwondo and what have you. So I make a point to put every single one of those people in my, my database and, and I actively talk to them. I listen to their conversations. I offer help if I hear somebody, just like David was saying earlier, if I hear somebody that needs um, a plumber or they, you know, they need a good lawn person or whatever it is, you know, I make a point to give them those, those referrals. Um, and not, not necessarily because I'm trying to find business um, because it's the right thing to do to help them, but they always remember that. So, um, so that's my networking is is talking to people in my community that end up being in my sphere too. All right. Now I knew Dawn was going to be giving us kind of that as her answer. So I was kind of setting all of you up. Now that you've heard Dawn's answer of what a networking group is, how many of you are actually in a networking group? Your kids go to dance class. They're playing on the school baseball team. They play in little league. They they do some extracurricular activity that you're involved with, and you're sitting there with a whole bunch of parents that you see at drop-off time and pick-up time and all that kind of stuff. Now how many of you are part of a networking group? Because I was surprised to see very few people were part of an official networking group, but I'm sure many of the people on our call are part of networking groups, such as being with their kids and things like that. So let's keep moving as we fly through this, because I'm looking so forward to getting to the technology side of this, but we got to cover some of that traditional stuff still anyway. There's a big one, expired. So tell me about expireds. What's working best for you guys? Are you touching them? Are you going after them? Do you mail to them? Do you call them? Do you just show up and knock on their door? Dawn, are you working on an expired market? No, sir, I am not. That is a David thing. All right, so then let's jump over to David. And David, are you working in an expired market? Yes, uh, that is probably about 10 to 15% of my inventory market is expires and withdrawn. So that's a good size group. Ten to fifteen percent of your inventory are expireds or withdrawns. Do you target them with with phone calls? Do you just show up knocking on their door? How do you target expireds and go about that traditional form of lead generation for those expired listings? To me, the easiest way to reach an expired is just picking up the phone and calling. Um, I know that for some people on the call, that might be a very intimidating thing. And when I started prospecting for expires and withdrawals, it was to, I would just stare at the phone and stare at the phone and stare at the phone until I finally could pick the phone up. And I was just so concerned about rejection or someone saying something sideways to me on the phone or just any negative thing that you can think of to make as an excuse to pick up the phone. What I've come to find out is, is that 95% of the people that you call on the phone they're actually going to be nice to you. And then there's 4% they are just busy. You just caught them at a bad time. They were either walking out, going to work, or they have a crying baby, or they have 75 million people running around the house because they have family in town. Uh, it, I, I cannot remember a time 
where I have picked up the phone to call an expired or withdrawn, that someone's been mean to me. Now, I might not have never gotten the business or gotten an appointment, but they've been very nice to me. And I think it comes from having the correct mindset, the mindset of coming from contribution, picking up the phone. And I think a lot of people, when they get on the phone, they want to sell. They want to say, well, I can sell your house in so many days, or I can give you this if you list with me. I think the best approach is to come at someone and just say, I'm David Patterson. I'm calling to see if your house is still on the market. Is it still available for sale? And depending upon what that answer is, is where we'll go forward with regards to the conversation. It's amazing that if you have the right scripts, if you ask the right questions, you'll find out everything you need to know with regards to the house, what it's being sold for, what, what they want to do when they sell it, what their financial situation is. People love to talk if you ask the right questions and be quiet and just listen. So I, I would really encourage a lot of people just to go out, just get 20 expired that expired in the month of June and just call them because one of the things you're going to find out is, is that you have 10, 15, 20 agents that will call expired on October 1st. And then that will go to five to eight by October 15th. And then by the end of October, it will be two or three. And by January 1st or December 15th, nobody will be calling them until the beginning of the year. So if you stay in touch with these individuals, if you keep persistent with regards to calling them, you will get inventory on the market with your name. Perfect. All right. Now, Don, you mentioned before that you do a lot of farming. So give everybody kind of a quick recap on farming and how they should do that. <laughs> sure. Um, I started farming, um, well, I tried to do it in my neighborhood. My neighborhood was um, pretty overwrought with agents fighting for territory in there. And, and so I found myself in a smaller neighborhood that I had been lucky enough to um, um, list and sell a couple of homes in nearby. And um, it was about 165, 170 homes in there. So I adopted that neighborhood and I just started um, you know, promoting myself so that I could get business and get in there and get my signs in there. Um, and then I contacted the, um, the HOA president and asked them if they had sponsorship opportunities um, that I could help them with and we came up with the idea to do a twice a year garage sale. Um, so I do a, a really big uh, production when it comes to that for them. I, I do all the advertising. Um, you know, we have signs out front, we map and, you know, a big deal. And then I walk the, I walk the neighborhood every time we have a garage sale and bring donuts or breakfast packers or whatever to the people that are up early when they're setting up the tables, um, just so I can spend some time and visit with them. And um, I do, um, when we're signing up for that, because that's a really big deal for me uh, twice a year, I walk the neighborhood the weekend, um, probably three weeks in advance, and try to get more sign-ups by going door-to-door. -door. I walk, I introduce myself, um, tell them who I am. Most of the time, they know who I am. Give them the flyer, um, chit-chat, and then and then go. You know, um, it's good exercise, and it gets me in front of them, and it helps me um, get to know their families better. So I do that. Um, and then, you know, what's really interesting is that over the, I mean, I usually sell probably I don't know, there's only about, in that neighborhood, there's probably only about eight to ten houses that sell a year, and I, I have about 33%, I guess, is my share in that neighborhood. Um, but it's really funny is that people, when they call me for a listing appointment, they're always shocked to find out that I don't actually live there um, because they see me so often and we talk so often that they think that I live in the neighborhood and I actually don't. So um, it's been really good for me, and I've made good friends, and I'm the only person that they've allowed on their Facebook um, page that doesn't live in the neighborhood. So there you go. Suzanne's um, asking, how many days does it take you, Don, to do the 165 homes? How many what? Days does it take you to kind of go through the community? Oh, did you walk it? Yes. I I walk it in about four hours in an afternoon. I'm quick. I mean, you know, you're not going to get everybody at home, um, okay. but I do. And if they're not there, then I leave them a little note. Perfect. All right, so now we've yeah. talked a lot about traditional lead generation. We need to diversify in many ways. So, of course, we're going to go from the traditional to the technological. David, you said to me 40 to 60% of your business should be traditional. So am I going to guess the other 40 to 60% should be 
should be in the world of technology. Is that your belief? Well, for me, that's my comfort level. I, I believe that the, the strength that we have with regards to technology is it's 24-7, 365. I don't know how many times that I have been awakened to a text hitting my iPhone at 2.30 in the morning from someone that's on my website. Um, that's the great thing about technology is, is that if it's set up the right way, you are always prospecting. And so it, it's really important to do your research and education with regards to what tools will help you get the right exposure and the right amount of leads that you're looking for on a 24-7, 365 basis. And Don, you said 50% before, so the other 50%, obviously, my math is being uh, pretty good this morning. The other 50% going towards technology? Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. Okay. Yeah. Are you answering text messages at 2.30 in the morning as well from people on your website? Oh, only, no. Mm -mm, no. Okay. But, but as soon as I get up at 6.30, absolutely. All right. Perfect. So one of the things about technology, the ability for a drip campaign. So. David, are you running a drip campaign? I am. I'm running a A by A33 touch, as they would call it. Tell everybody a little bit about that. Well, basically, an eight by eight is basically representative of eight weeks and eight messages within those eight weeks. So once a week, I'm sending them something and actually taking a step back. Uh, one of the things that I've been blessed enough to be involved with the IMSD. Uh, training is actually launching what's called the 10 days of pain and that is something that everybody if you don't get your whole your hands on anything else you really need to come to appreciate the 10 days of pain and understanding how that allows you to build some sort of relationship with these people immediately before you ease off and doing an eight by eight so every day of those 10 days uh, there's something that you should be sending or picking up the phone and calling or just some way that you can try to touch them to build a relationship. I know that right now some of the move right now is actually video and incorporating a 10 days of the pain that might be just all videos. I, I don't care if it's a postcard. I don't care if it's a letter. I don't care if it's a phone call, an email, whatever it is. You need to organize a 10 days of pain and then come right behind it with an 8 by 8 and then the 33 touches basically can be something as simple as making sure that you're touching somebody throughout the course of a year 33 times. So it can be 12 times you're sending the newsletter. So it's once a month you're sending the newsletter and then maybe some other item of value throughout the course of that each particular month and then sending something on the holidays like Thanksgiving or Christmas. But make sure that three to four of those touches is actually picking up the phone and calling them to stay in flow with them, finding out about the kids, finding out how the vacation went, finding out how things are going with the house. You sold them the house. So you really need to be in tune with it. So you are assuming that at some point they are going to come to you to sell that house. So you, that's one of the ways to stay not only intimate with the house, but intimate with what's going on with your clientele. And I think the 8 by 8 33 touch with a definitely – uh, appetizer of the 10 days of pain is an awesome thing for prospects. Wow. That great answer. Don, do you have anything you want to add to that about a drip campaign or uh, did David do a pretty good job of covering that? David rocks. Um, no, I, I think he covered everything I would have said. So okay. no, I mean, I, I'm completely on board with that answer. Perfect. Well, what about while I've got you then, Don? Off on stuff? Say that Hi. again, David. Isn't it great when Don signs off on things? It's so powerful. It doesn't happen often. So when you can get Don to agree and, and not, you know, talk too much. So we'll uh, ask him about your proper email address and, and email signatures and things like that. Don, what what are your recommendations? Should should I be updating my email address since it's you know chat at aol dot com or is that still okay? Um. No. Yeah. I think you might want to reconsider that. Um, David and I had a big conversation about this last week when we were talking about this call, and I don't know, it could just be a pet peeve of mine that when I go to contact another agent um, at a different brokerage and they have a an AOL or or um, Gmail, not Yahoo, I don't know. When I see those, I just think I just don't think that it's quite as professional 
as having um, you know your name.com or even your brokerage name. I mean, you probably need to have your own um, name registered and, and be using that. That I know I use my KW account. So um, I think that's really important. I think your email signature is extremely important. It needs to be um, short and concise, but give the the important information so they can easily reach you. Um, so yeah, I mean, David, what what do you think about that? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do. I, I know this is about this is a class. I mean, a, a webinar that we're talking about actually lead generation and diversifying. But I think part of doing proper lead generation is actually having a proper brand. And I'm not a person that l looks to brand Yahoo or Gmail or even any other company, whether it be Carwell, Remax, Keller Williams. ERA, whatever company it may be, I am in business for myself, David Patterson, Inc. So it is my responsibility, not my companies, not my coaches, no one, it is my responsibility to brand myself. And so if I do not have an email address that's either my name or my brand, I'm losing an opportunity to get in front of people to tell people what I do, where I do it, and how well that I do it. So. I would challenge everybody that's on the phone, if you do not have an email address that is your name or something that's related to your brand, do not let the sun set today without you doing it. So everybody should be going out there and registering their own name is what you're saying. So I have Absolutely. Chatheims .com. Own their own name. Matter of fact, to the point where I've encouraged my, my sister to buy my nieces and nephews' names so that they can have it. You don't know where they're going to be three, five, 10, 12 years from now. You have to think that way. I, I'm a very analytical person. A lot of people laugh at me like, about that because I think a lot of things through, but normally in the end, people don't end up laughing because they're saying, hey, they thought about that three, four, five years ago. So it's really important for you guys to buy your name. Even if you don't know what you're gonna do with it yet, at least buy it and have it because there will be people that will be out there that's trying to buy it and sell it back to you. Interesting point. And one of the things we do talk about, just a little tip from the IMSD program, is search engine optimization. One of the things the websites are looking for is age of your site. So even if you buy your child's website now and they don't use it for five or ten years, depending where your child is in life, you've at least developed the age on that website, giving them a head start when it comes to it and growing that site. So excellent. I, GoDaddy.com is one that we use. They're just quick. They're just easy. I figured I'd put the logo up instead of a picture of uh, Danica Patrick or whatever ripping off her jacket or something. I don't know what trouble I might have gotten in from that. So we're talking about emails and owning our own domains and all that stuff. What about making sure our profiles are all complete and that 100% and we finish them and our signature is complete to tell us where we go? Don, how important is it to make sure that on Facebook I'm telling them everything, to make sure that on Active Rain I'm filling in all that stuff and that I'm giving that 100% complete profile? Oh my gosh, it's so important. Um, there's there's nothing more frustrating to, I think, any consumer when they are trying to contact you or learn about you, find out what your background is, um, or or another agent that's thinking about working with you, and and for you to not have that information out there. Um, so I think that's just critical. Um, I, I spend a lot of time working on on all of my sites and making sure they're up to date. Um, on with the information and things that I've uh, accomplished and things I'm working on, that kind of thing. So I think that's critical. And David, same thing with you. You believe that obviously take the extra minute, fill in the profile, make sure you're getting all that stuff out there? Actually, I think you should take five. I think it's really important for you to be very detailed about any and everything that you can put on your profile that can make a connection with someone. And I would be willing to bet that if you do your profile properly in some of the best platforms, such as Active Rain, since this is an Active Rain sponsored call, that is an excellent place for you to have a great, thorough profile. And I, I would bet that you would get two transactions a year just because you have a thorough profile that is set up, that has the proper search engine optimization, um, a good photo, and very detailed information about you and what you do. I'm literally closing a deal, God willing, Thursday, 
because a lady saw something on my profile page and chose me because we had that in common. And so I can't stress enough how people should spend time with those profile pages. And, and there's a great example of what you can do with your domain name. There's tools out there like aboutme.com, A-B-O-U-T dot me. Uh, what that can do for you is simply just create a nice little one-page synopsis of who you are. So go get that domain name, attach it to that about.me, and move forward. It will bring you business. Okay. Yeah, so, I agree with that, Sam. Go on. You got something else you want to add to oh, that? Oh, sorry. Well, yeah. You know, last week I took a buyer out from Las Vegas. Um, she registered on my website. I asked her how she found me. She said she... Um, she actually found her way to a like a secondary lead generation website I had running, and then when she she took it a few steps further, she went and Googled me, and she she found my active range, she found um, my web my Keller Cal Williams website, she found everything, and the thing that that she honed in on was the fact that I didn't just have in my profile that I serve on the PTA board, I had in my profile that I serve on the PTA board for Frisco ISD. Um, and she was only considering moving to the Frisco area and Frisco schools um, from Vegas. And so that was a big um, deal for her. And, and I know you're going to have a good chuckle over this, but I've actually had people pick me before, too, because I'm a Longhorn. Um, and they were not going to do this with an Aggie. Wait, so, you're um, a Longhorn <laughs> fan? Okay, we will be muting you the rest of the call. <laughs> And we will just continue on. Boom or sooner, baby. All right, so let's keep moving on here and get to what everybody really wants to know about. Now, we're not going to dive into every social network that's out there because, one, we've only got about five or ten minutes left on the call. Uh, one of the questions Dawn has asked is, are you guys using Facebook as a database? Who? Somebody else asked that? Yes, Donna is asking that right now. Oh, She's Donna. typed that in. She's asking me, do you guys use Facebook as a database? Uh, I absolutely do. It's, it's not my main database, but I, I absolutely work it as a database, for sure. Okay. And, I'd David, say, are you using it I'd... as a database? Absolutely. Facebook is the one of the best databases you can have, but it should not be the only database you have. But absolutely, I'm using Facebook as a database. I was actually surprised. I exported mine last night uh, for another project that I'm working on. I exported my Facebook database, and it was uh, 51 pages long, triple columned. There was a... Uh, a lot of people in that database for me to be in contact with. So Donna wants a little bit more. She wants to know how are you using it as a database. Now I know you're obviously contacting people. Are you actually using lists? Are you using groups? Are you breaking the people down? How are you using it as a database? Um, yeah, I Facebook probably accounts for I would say probably easily 25 percent of my business every year, um, and I use it. I do have groups. Um, set up. Most of the time, everything that I post is pretty transparent to anybody out there that I have in, in Facebook land, but I do have my past clients. Um, I have people that live in my neighborhood, um, you know, different groups that I belong to, social groups, sports, you know, that kind of stuff, and, and so they get specific messages that everybody else doesn't see. But, um, but it's really been effective for me. I mean, I don't, I, I used to post before I learned I used to post all of my listings and open houses and all those things, and I don't really do that anymore um, because I found that I that I it was not a popular thing to post. Um, but now I I talk about my clients, you know, their successes and you know congratulations on their house and um, you know I talk about my day to day life and my day to day business, and then my clients um, pipe in and they have conversations with each other about their experiences. So it's it's just um, it's a great relationship database. I, I find it much more fun, honestly, <laughs> than my other database. Um, but, uh, but certainly it's not the only one I'm working. Okay. David, how are you using it as your database? How are you actually using it? Well, it's interesting because Facebook for me, and, and Chad, just to kind of set it up a little bit, in my mind, I have two databases. One is an automated database. And one is an interactive database. And so 
for me, Facebook is the interactive database. We were talking earlier about having the 8x8 and the 33 touch, where we are touching people at least 33 times a year. Well, with Facebook, I can touch people 99 times a year. Um, I'm able to group them in lists, and I can get involved in groups online, and I can, through my posts that I have in either my status updates or through, uh, I love music, so I try to try to connect with as many people as, as I can through the different songs and different artists that I like. Um, that gives me an opportunity to stay in front of them and also to touch them. But the one key thing, Chad, that I think that helps me with my database is by using that database as Facebook in a way to lead generate for other agents. Okay. Interesting. Explain and that I a want little bit more. To get this point, because if you are taking opportunities with the network of people that you have in Facebook, whether it be in Washington State or California or the District of Columbia or Plano, Texas. Whatever, whatever, wherever place it may be, you have people that you know that you went to school with 20 years ago, or you met at some function five years ago that might be looking to buy a house. And if you're paying attention to your database, that is Facebook, for these messages that they post out that that says, "Hey, my sister's going to buy a house," or "We just got a new job in Atlanta," or "We're having a new baby," and the and our family is growing. These give you opportunities to reach out and say, hey, I know an agent in Plano, Texas. Don Rose is a great agent. Give me an opportunity to connect you with her so that you guys can go and find that next house. When you are using Facebook as a database in which you're touching people and staying in flow, it gives you opportunity to send business to other individuals which in turn, the Don Roses, hopefully, and, and other individuals that are out there connected with me on Facebook, they're sending me business. And so to me, that is an interactive database where it gives you much more of a chance to earn referrals and new clients. Oh, I love that, David. What a great way to look at it. Now, let's talk about some of the other social networks that are out there quickly. Where should people be for lead generation? What would be the top three social networking sites that you believe they should be on, David? Facebook is number one. That's going to be 80 to 85 percent of my focus. Uh, I think 10 percent of my focus would be um, on Twitter and interacting with diverse groups of people, especially in Columbia. One of the things that I would encourage people on the call is go out there in your Twitter account and just do a search for your particular town and look for the highly active people on Twitter and interact with them because that gives you an opportunity to build relationships. I have a, a young lady that's involved in uh, one of the political parties down here. I won't tell you which one because we don't want to get into political thing, but I was able to meet her through Twitter and had an opportunity to actually list her house because we built a relationship through Twitter. So I would say 10% of, of that interaction is through Twitter. And then the last 5% would be YouTube and a tool out there that's called Blog Talk Radio. Uh, that allows me to take my offline real estate show that I have in Columbia and put it online. And so that allows you to create content that will always be out there on the Internet that allows you to build credibility with people and gives you an opportunity to lead, generate, and that 365, 24-7 mode. So, David, if we want to know more about the Blog Talk Radio, how do we do that? Uh, I know you host a show. I know I believe tomorrow morning we're actually on it together. How would everybody see it? Should they just be following you on Facebook and Twitter? You post about it so they could learn more about your radio show? Shameless plug. That's great. Thank you, Chad, for setting me up. That's awesome. hey, no problem. <laughs> um, there's a Facebook page that is uh, the David Patterson Show. So if you just go to Facebook.com slash David Patterson Show, it will give you the information that you need about when we have our show and – Blog Talk Radio, so that's B-L-O-G-T-A-L-K-R-A-D-I-O.com. So if you just go to that site, it is a free site to do shows up to 30 minutes. Uh, if you want to do anything a little upscale or you want to go longer than 30 minutes, there are fees that are associated with that. But stay in the free environment until you know what you're doing before you start spending money. So those are the two best tools that you can go and, and learn about our show. 
So there you go. For those of you still hanging on towards the end of the call, David just shared one of the best tools with you. Dawn, the three social media mm -hmm. sites they should play with. Well, obviously Facebook. Um, that's that's number one. Um, Twitter, I, I agree with David. It's it's not necessarily about your your clients. I mean, it, it can be, in the, but I think it's about building relationships with people in your community and agent to agent referrals. I have a, a big network of realtors around the country that I have friends with on Twitter. Um, and then um, you know, I, I do have a LinkedIn account. I, I really don't spend very much time with it, um, but my focus um, for the next probably six to nine months is going to be blogging, but more specifically video blogging. Um, I'm really trying to make video a big part of my, my business. Um, I really think it's effective. Um, so that's probably what I'm going to be spending my time. So I would, I would definitely say have a, have a WordPress uh, blog or an Active Rain blog, whichever your cup of tea is, um, and uh, get out there and just start talking. Great. That's wonderful. Um, one of the things that I was just wanting to add to that, Don, is the fact that the LinkedIn page is something that I have not focused a lot on as well. But I had an opportunity one Sunday, just I had some time, so I needed to go out there and update my profile. And they have a new feature out there that when you have your profile updated, you can actually click this link and it will print for you a kind of like a resume. It's 